Meguiar's presents Car Crazy, the show that focuses on the people behind the cars. Most kids like to play with cars, but for some, it becomes an obsession. This type of person, and there are millions of us, have an unusual preoccupation with cars. And sometimes it is not at all rational. Indeed, we are talking about people of all ages and all walks of life who are certifiably car crazy. Hi, I'm Barry McGuire, and I've spent my entire life working and associated with people who are crazy about their cars. This show is intended to gain insight into these people and understand why they are so car crazy. It's been called a contagious disease, and we hope this show will help you catch the bug, if you haven't already. This episode of Car Crazy is one of a very special series of shows. I get asked all the time what my favorite episode of Car Crazy is, or who has been my best interview, or what is my favorite story. Well, they're all my favorites, but there are some that stand out. So we selected some of our best stories from our past guests and collected them in this very special series of Car Crazy episodes. Today's guests are four of the most prolific automotive journalists of our time. They have documented the lives of some of the most fascinating people in the car world, in turn, becoming legends in their own right. On today's show, We'll chat with Bob Peterson, and David E. Davis, Brock Yates, yeah. and Denise McCluggage and relive automotive history through their eyes and personal experiences. After this break, we'll look back at four great interviews with some of the most intriguing automotive journalists of our time. So don't go away. This is going to be a great show. Welcome back to Car Crazy. Of all the automotive journalists in history, none have been as wildly successful as Robert E. Peterson. With little more than a camera and a dream, Bob created an automotive publishing empire. He's not only a journalist, but an entrepreneur, an historian, and philanthropist. His contributions to the automotive world are innumerable. He has acted as mentor and role model to generations of both journalists and enthusiasts. We took some time to sit down right here in the museum he created to explore his incredible 60-year career. My dad told me the way to learn how to work on a car was to start washing parts. So most of my early career, I washed parts. And I learned every part in a car by washing it. And that was his, his uh, theory. Uh, so I didn't care for that that much. I wanted to get on and tune carburetors. But uh, eventually, I wound up at MGM uh, working as a messenger. And I wound up being a PR man and went in the service, came back, and then they fired us all. So we formed a company called the uh, Hollywood Publicity Associates, and we handled amongst all kinds of people a real crazy guy, Madman Muntz. Yeah. Yeah. And Madman Muntz said, give me some great PR deal connecting, connected with racing. And I said, well, why don't we do a hot rod show? We'll take the money, and we will uh, build the Madman Muntz drag strip. He said, wonderful idea. So that's what we started with. And then he had some uh, temporary financial problems. <laughs> <laughs> and so we went on doing the car show yeah. anyway. Which was really the first hot rod show. And it was the first hot rod show in uh, January of 48. And at the same time, Bob Lindsay, a fellow I worked with at MGM, he and I said, why don't we do a magazine? So we came out exactly the same time, January 48, with the first hot rod magazine. Uh, very struggling, not, you don't have any money. You're up in the stands, you're selling the, the magazines yourself in the stands, right, with a coin changer on your oh, yeah. waist. Well, I'd shoot pictures down at the races, and then I'd go up and sell the magazines in the stands. And I, I did have a lot of friends. We had, I had friends from all over that would go out and sell magazines for us, uh, write stories, and uh, it, it was just, there were a lot of hot rod guys that just pitched in and helped. One of the best parts of being a journalist is experiencing life to its fullest. Bob is always ready for a challenge, especially when it comes to adventure. What's your, your, your best memory, driving memory, driving experience of your own? I guess some of the hairiest driving I ever did was uh, driving with Mickey Thompson in the Mexican road race. And uh, he said, you want to be my co-pilot? Uh, my co-pilot can't make it today, and would you like to ride with me? And I said, oh, sure. 
Like so that. he sticks me in the car, and I said, where's the seat? And he says, uh, well, it's that uh, apple box there. You're supposed to sit on that. <laughs> and he's going through these turns <laughs> at 100 miles an hour, and I'm sitting on an apple box. You know? <laughs> I said, Ricky, I'm a little scared. You know, I don't think this is too, <laughs> too safe. He said, oh, don't worry about it. He said, I've been doing this for years. <laughs> so we did all that. We had a lot of fun down there. With your dad being the mechanic and you working with him in the garage, I, I suppose that was where you first uh, started working on your first car? Well, I, I learned how to weld and do everything. And uh, so I built a, uh, a car of some various parts I bought for very, very low money. I had a uh, 34 Ford uh, engine, and I put it in a uh, 27T chassis, and uh, it was pretty bad according to today's standards, but it was great to me. <laughs> and what was the next car after that? Well, of course, I drove my dad's car, and he had a 36 Chevy, which we all laughed at because we thought that was an old, an old folks car. But we'd all get in it, and we'd uh, drive it at speed, which he didn't know. And so in those days, they had recap tires. Yeah. So we were out driving at speed, and i go around a turn, and all four recaps slid off. All four? And all four just slid right off because the tires were hot and they just slid off. And I went back to my dad and I said, boy, I said, you better go to the guy that put these recaps on. I said, he didn't do a good job. They just fell right off. <laughs> my dad says, boy, that's terrible. Said, yeah, I'll go back and get him. Right after this break, we'll sit down with one of my dear friends, the legendary David E. Davis. Welcome back to McGuire's Car Crazy. David E. Davis' name has graced the masthead of almost every automotive magazine. His stories have entertained and documented five decades of automotive enthusiasm. Interestingly, he found his calling as a journalist only after a life-altering event on the racetrack. I was a simple kid from the Midwest. As far as I was concerned, California was the absolute epicenter of all automobile racing. And here I was leading my race in my MG and I couldn't trust my mirror because it was vibrating so badly. So when I saw a pit signal that said I was leading by quite a margin, I tried to look over my shoulder and see where everybody was. And as I came to the end of the straight, past the pits, there was a pile of hay bales that marked a turn off the main straight. The left front wheel of the car caught the turn. I drove up the face of the hay bales, and the car continued in the air until it lost its momentum came down upside down, I had my head caught between the back of the seat and the pavement and slid the width of the road that way. And at that point, I was wearing a brand new helmet with a face shield and I put my hands up to my face and my face shield was hanging down over here and I thought, this can't be right. And I reached in past the face shield and I had no nose, which was very clear when I put my hand on it. And uh, I thought, this is serious. I came as close to having an out-of-body experience, I think, as one can come. I, I began to talk about myself or think about myself in the third person. <laughs> You're observing all this like a journalist keeping track yeah. and writing a story yeah. about what's taking yeah. place. I was, I was extraordinarily fortunate. There was a wonderful plastic surgeon who had just joined the staff at the Sacramento Community Hospital. He was waiting for me when I was brought in. Now, you have talked about how that horrible experience really shaped the rest of your life. Oh, no question, absolutely. I wanted to stay close to cars. I knew by that time that I was really obsessive about automobiles, enjoyed all the time I had spent with them, all of my sort of minor league automobile racing. In thinking about all that, I composed a letter which I sent to all of the automobile magazines that existed at that time and offered them my services as a writer. David E. has been on hand to see the progression of racing as a popular sport. He has seen drivers go from obscurity to fame firsthand, but one incident in particular stood out for him. Well, you did uh, and have so many wonderful relationships with some of the, some of the great drivers. One that uh, we've lost, Juan Fangio, who you had yeah. just a wonderful relationship yeah. with. Talk about. Fangio, for the benefit of anyone who doesn't know, had had a, quite a long career in local racing in Argentina and around South America. And then Perón decided, uh, the president of Argentina decided that it would be a good idea for the Argentine Automobile Club to put up a sum of money for a group of, say, three very good Argentine drivers to go to Europe and try their luck there 
supported by the Automobile Club of Argentina. Fangio was one of those drivers, mm -hmm. and That's he was hugely successful. But he was already 39 years old, and he won five world championships after his 40th birthday. He took us to dinner in an open-air restaurant in a park in, uh, in the Ricoletta section of uh, Buenos Aires. And we walked down a flight of stairs into this beautiful restaurant and it was sort of laid out in a rectangular way and there were lots of tables and the people on one side of all the tables were looking right at us as we came in. And as Fangio came down the stairs leading us, over here a guy stands up at his plate, takes his napkin and puts it down on the table and then just stands there smiling as Fangio comes in and somebody sees this guy, what he's doing and looks and sees he's, Fangio's coming in, he stands up and pretty soon all the men in the restaurant are on their feet. They don't clap. They don't reach out to shake hands with him. They don't speak mm. to him. Mm. We just walk down through this group of probably 30 or 40 standing men to our table. And when we get to the table, Fangio turns around and does a big smile and a gesture, and everyone sits down again, and we have our dinner. But it was one of the most moving moments of my life to walk into that very elegant restaurant and have everybody on their feet for Fangio. We have another fabulous interview for you with Auto Week's Denise McCluggage, right after this break. Welcome back to McGuire's Car Crazy. Denise McCluggage is an experiential journalist, writing from the first person and usually doing what it is she writes about. She not only got to meet with and write about famous drivers, she became one as well, racing against the greats like Juan Fangio, Sterling Moss, and Phil Hill. I had a reputation for doing what I wrote about. And so, you know, I got paid for going to races and driving. And I'd jump out and I'd say, who finally won that thing? Fitch passed me and then Hans came. And you know, then I'd, you can tell how long ago it was because I'd put my typewriter on a stack of tires. Oh now boy, you only need oh one. Yeah. You know, and they You've won a number of titles, some of them so fancy I can't even pronounce them. Well, I, I've won the Women's Cup in a number of races and things and rallies. Like as I won. Whatever, yeah, the like Copa de Damas, yeah, whatever, in, in, in Venezuela <laughs> and in the Can Canadian Rally. And uh, I won my class in Monte Carlo. That wasn't so fancy, but that was nice. But I didn't win a lot of. Uh, you know, like championships or things, because they didn't have them and they didn't have uh, a runoffs. And I just ran a certain race at certain times when anybody would offer you a ride, you know. Though Denise is the first female journalist to be entered into the Automotive Hall of Fame, she's really an accidental pioneer. She never set out to break down the walls between men and women in the workplace. She merely followed her interests and ended up a legend. At one point in time, you were credited as being the top woman race driver in America and one of the top six in the world. Well, I mean, it all depends on who's doing the rating, right? I mean, it, it's sort of like being the best photographer for the Reader's Digest, you know? Oh, you sell yourself short. No, no, I mean, there weren't many of us. And, uh, I mean, yeah, I had, a, I had a knack. I did, indeed. I had a, a knack for it. My talent, whatever I had, was unschooled and, and just there. And I happen to have a sense of motion and placement and uh, the proprioceptive centers that you know gave you the right messages and you responded correctly. So what was it like beating all these men? Guys at that time, it was, they didn't like to be beaten by a woman. And in fact, for a while, I would discover to an odd chance that every time I'd pass a guy, his car would break. I mean, it, often we'd be in dice, dice, and we'd be having fun, and then he'd stop at the pits. I didn't realize this until a guy, a, a, after I said, gosh, we were having so much fun, it's too bad your car broke. And he said, yeah, yeah. Then later he came up to me and says, there's nothing wrong with the car. I just didn't want to be teased for being oh, beaten by a woman. Really? And I felt so really? sorry for him. You know, I thought, she needed to miss that kind of wonderful fun we were having with my friend Gus Andre. He was in a two-liter Ferrari. I was in Briggs's Porsche RS, a hundred, one and a half liter RS. And it was at Montgomery. And I was not only beating him, I was lapping him. And he didn't like this. 
particularly so we're right by the turn in the paddock and I'm just ready to pass him to lap him and he turns into me and danced the car. I said, he did it, breaks his car. <laughs> and I'm gonna take that after him and show him. And then I thought, hey, I don't need to lap the guy. I've beaten him. And furthermore, we were going into this chicane I laid out with hay bales in those days. And I look at the mirror and Walt Hanskin's coming up, you know, in the, really fast. And I thought, I don't want to get in his way. So I back off and let him by. Well, Gus decides he can make it anyway. And he goes through there. It was like thrashing time in Kansas. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> hey, everywhere, you know? And so I pass him and I thought, ha, ha, ha. But then I was still furious. He had dented the car. Well, everybody had seen this because it was right where they were hanging around you know, watching. So we parked the cars in the paddock and everyone, I go over to Gus's car and everyone's standing in a semicircle like this, watching what's gonna happen, you know? And I thought, oh, this is a dramatic moment. <laughs> yeah, so I wait, for all it's worth. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Three beats, <laughs> and then I said, if you were a man, I'd hit you. <laughs> and turned on my heel, walked off, right? <laughs> and you know, Gus was so nice after that, I mean, he, he, he just, you know, he admitted that this was a wrong thing and he had a wrong, you know, consciousness raising moment, I guess. So, we, you know, we're very dear friends after that. It was very sweet. Don't go away. When we come back, McGuire's Car Crazy visits with the ever engaging Brock Yates. Welcome back to McGuire's Car Crazy. Brock Yates is a car guy from way back. As a journalist, he's unparalleled, but it is the cross-country race he created that changed his reputation from famous to infamous. I decided one day uh, that we ought to have a, a, a no-holds-barred race from New York to Los Angeles. And there was a great cross-country driver by the name of Ernest Cannibal Baker, and he had done a bunch of record runs in the 1920s and 30s, and uh, so I, I named the event after him. Oh, and by the way, there was urban legend that Wilt Chamberlain had uh, driven a Maserati or something across the country in like 38 hours nonstop. It was on, nobody, that may, may or may not happen, I have no idea. <laughs> we set out to break what we thought that would be that record. And we ended up, we took a, a Dodge van and uh, modified it a little bit. And I took uh, two friends of mine. Yeah, this was just you, one car. Me. Yeah. yeah, well we had some and other guys who were gonna go and they all bailed out so at the just end. just your one vehicle and you That's took right. out. Oh, well, we did, just went across the country. We got lost and, and uh, had some horrible uh, slowdowns and ran out of gas and a bunch of, and it took us 41 hours. <laughs> Still pretty amazing, Yeah, it was pretty hours. good, yeah, it was pretty good. So I did a column in Car and Driver about it, and uh, the, uh, the Polish Racing Drivers of America sent me a telegram, and they said, uh, we'll beat you, if you ever run, run another one, we'll beat you to California if, in fact, we can find California, which I thought was pretty funny. So we'd run the first one in April of 1971. So we re decided to reorganize another one in, in November of 1971. And that was when uh, uh, I ended up with a Ferrari Daytona with Dan Gurney, my old teammate. And the Polish Racing Drivers of America brought a van that they had mounted five 55-gallon drums of fuel in the back. And they had this rat's nest of hoses connecting these five <laughs> barrels of gasoline in the back of this van. Yeah, imagine if somebody had hit them. <laughs> I, those idiots, they ran out of gas in Albuquerque, <laughs> no. 800 miles short of the, uh, yeah, I mean, they're, they're perfect Polish <laughs> racing driver's effort. Actually, they refueled and did finish second behind Gurney and I. I've got the challenger here that we ran second and third in, and the races we did in 72 and 75. And then we did the last one. In, uh, in 79, the ambulance that was used in, in the movie was the actual ambulance that uh, myself, the director Hal Nita, my wife Pamela, and a, and a doctor from uh, L.A. actually used in the, real, in the real one. The funny part is why you actually drove the ambulance in the race. <laughs> yeah, it was a perfect scam, Barry. I mean, guys are doing a lot of scams. Uh, Peter Brock, who designed the Cobras, he and three other guys ran in 1972 disguised as priests. But the ambulance was perfect. It just and it was the siren the, on. Oh, it was perfect. <laughs> I was driving and we were trying to figure out all the lights. We had we had lights on it, we were flashing the lights and sirens and stuff. And that uh, the uh, New Jersey Highway Patrol nailed us. My wife Pamela was the patient. We had her in the back in a gurney, 
She had a, a, a water bottle that was draining down her arm. It was supposed to be some kind of an IV bottle. The doctor was a guy, he was a, uh, we've never mentioned his name in public because he probably loses his license, but he was a, a, a radiologist from UCLA Medical Center. And he was sitting in the ambulance and he had his stethoscope on and his green surgical smock. And these two cops, Jer Jersey Highway Patrol cops said, where are you guys going? We had Michigan plates on it, had that phony <laughs> Transcon <laughs> Medic, Medic Vac uh, uh, logo on the thing. And he said, we said, Needham said, we're going to California. We're going to Cedar Sinai, uh, LA. <laughs> <laughs> and the guy, the guy said, what are you, what are you going to, or, have you got a patient in there? And we said, yeah. And, uh, and he said, well, why can't you fly her? And I said, I said, well, you better ask the doctor. And we walked around and signed a thing. We slid that th door open. My wife's laying there looking dead in this, in this, in this gurney. I mean, it was, it was edgy. And the and Dina and I are standing behind these two cops as they're waving their flashlights around inside this thing. I looked at Nita and then we knew. I mean, if we blew it at this point, we were going to jail. There's no doubt about it. Now, the doctor was gorgeous. He was unbelievable. He looked like a kid out of medical center anyway. And he said, Senator so-and-so, which was a good little touch. We'd not even practice that part. That was that helped. Senator so-and-so's wife has uh, cysts on her lungs, and she can't be flown in a pressurized airplane which was good, and I said, we've got 48 hours to get this woman to, to UCLA <laughs> Medical Center, which is even better. So that backed the cops down right away, and they, they turned to us and they said, well, you boys better take it easy, go slower and whatever, because you got the lights on and doing all that stuff. And it was so perfect. And then I wrote the scene and put it in the movie. Jack Elam is the doctor, and, uh, and Farrah Foss is the patient. But we almost uh, did the dialogue almost exactly verbatim. And I've often wondered, Barry, if um, those cops had got to have seen it. And they said, oh, God, why did they <laughs> that do was this? Us there. <laughs> uh, it's hard to believe, but it really happened. Well, that's all for now. This is such a treat for me to share some of the great people of my life with you. Hope you've enjoyed as much as we have. And I hope these stories will make you just a little bit more car crazy. Thanks for watching. Car Crazy has been brought to you by the Meguiar's family of appearance car care products. Meguiar's, the trusted experts in surface care since 1901.